induction quiz number one. Here we go. A circular loop of wire has a diameter of 0.1 meters. If it's removed from a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field in ten, a 0.1 seconds, what's the average induced EMF? So we're talking about a coil of wires, in which case EMF is equal to negative N change in flux over change in time. What's N? I heard it. You're right. What? Yeah, a ah, loop. N is one. Be alert for that because they'll do that quite often because it makes the math easier. But a lot of kids, I can't see N anywhere. Well, the word a uh, means one if they don't mention any other turns of wire. So N is going to be one. What's the change in time? 0.1 seconds. What's the change in flux? That's what I'm going to spend most of my math doing. I'll do that over here change in anything is final minus initial and flux is magnetic field final times area minus magnetic field initial times area if I'm removed from the magnetic field what's my final magnetic field Jacob zero. So as it turns out, my change in flux is going to be zero minus my initial magnetic field, which was 0.5, times the area that was in the magnetic field. I said they're going to give you three shapes, circle, rectangle, or square. This time it's a circle, and it's pi r squared. Now I have to be a bit careful. They gave me the diameter, so what's the radius? 0 0.05, and I'm running out of room, Mr. Duick. 0 0.05 squared. 0 minus 0.5 times pi times 0 0.05 squared. My change in flux is that there, negative 0.0039. Negative point zero zero three nine, and now I'm going to go walking back over here. Negative one, negative point zero zero three nine. But Erwin, I'm going to use my calculator value divided by point one. The voltage that this would generate, negative one times that answer divided by point one. You get 0 0.039 volts? Or am I wrong? No one nodding. Yes? 0 0.039 volts. Not very much. But rotating it at 0.1 seconds is pretty small, and that's a pretty small loop. <clears throat> A 0.5 meter long wire moves perpendicularly, that's good, that means it will have a voltage, induce a voltage, through a magnetic field at a speed of 20 meters per second. What's the induced EMF? So the induced EMF, BLV, magnetic field is 0.4, length of wire is 0.5, the velocity is 20, 0.4 times 0.5 times 20. How many volts will we get? Four volts. Now be careful, those of you that are writing the provincial exam, why would you lose a half mark stupidly here? It's, yeah, one sig fig. A lot of these may work out evenly. Don't forget two or three sig figs. Check your mock, check your tests, check your provincial, those of you that are writing the provincial, before you hand it in. Now, I marked the Physics 12 provincial once. And on the Physics 12 Provincial, on the actual marking day, they decided that they would ignore sig figs, but that was not in the rule book. That was just decided then, so go over it, those of you that are writing Provincial. If the wire is part of a circuit with resistance 6 ohms, what's the current? Okay, current is voltage divided by resistance. We have 4 volts divided by 6 ohms, 0.667 amps two-thirds of an amp. 
Number three. Okay, here's back voltage. The armature of a DC motor has resistance of 1.6 ohms when it's stationary. It's connected to a 12 volt battery. At full speed, the motor draws 0.62 amps of current. What's the back EMF? Well, let's see. The back EMF is equal to the full voltage minus whatever is left inside the armature. Do I know my full voltage here? 12 minus, do I know the current when I'm running at full speed? 0.62. Do I know the resistance of my arm? Now I do, often they won't tell you this. Often what they'll do is they'll tell you the current when it's stationary. If you know the current when it's stationary, what's the back voltage when it's stationary? <clears throat> zero, you'll know the source voltage and you can solve for the resistance. This one here is just straight plug and chug though. Eleven point nine? Am I wrong? Oh I did times. Thank you. Try that again. Eleven even. 11 volts. So there's still one volt in the actual arm of the motor. That means there is still a net positive current in the arm of the motor. Some heat will still be generated, but not much. An ideal step-up transformer, that means my secondary voltage is going to be bigger, has 50 turns. Secondary coil has 100, uh, sorry, 1,500 turns. Primary EMF is 12 volts. What's the secondary? So voltage primary divided by N primary equals Vs over, good gosh, Mr. Duick, V, yes, this works. What am I doing here? Let's try this again. Voltage primary over secondary equals N primary over N secondary. The other way works as well, but I was cross multiplying already. I didn't need to. We're going to get a primary voltage of 120. Secondary voltage is a mystery. Primary number of coils is 50. Secondary number of coils is 1500. The secondary voltage is going to be 120 times 1500 divided by 50. Thirty-six hundred volts. Is that right? If the secondary current is three amps, what's the primary current? Okay, so I'm going to use the number of coils because that's what they gave me. The number of coils on the primary divided by the number of coils on the secondary equals the current on the secondary divided by the current in the primary. And Evan, you'll notice for current, the S's and the P's don't line up. Current is the one that's opposite on your formula sheet. But now it is straight, straight plug and chug and cross multiply. It's going to be 50 on the primary, 1500 on the secondary equals current in the secondary is 3. Primary current is don't know. Primary current is 3 times 1500 divided by 50. Primary current is 900 or 90? 90? 90? Amps. Okay. There it is. Give yourself a score out of count them nine. So some question and answers here. Number 16 from the induction review. <coughs> says, the diagram below shows two coils in a magnetic field. One where there is a flux, one where there's a flux of zero. An electric current can be induced 
in the coil oriented with its plane. Now, A is wrong, and the reason A is wrong is we said it's not the magnetic field that causes voltage. The changing flux, which is usually a changing magnetic field. So A is wrong, C is wrong. Okay? Either B or D. Now, both of these have a changing magnetic field, which of them then, therefore, also has a changing flux? Flux was what times what? Times cross-sectional area. What's the area here? What's the flux here? How many lines are going through this particular shape here? So you know what? You're not going to be able to generate a current right here. So parallel, nope. Changing magnetic field here would do it. In fact, this would be exactly the same as when you move the magnet closer and closer to the coil. That would be an easy way to change the magnetic field. Move the magnet closer. That means the magnetic field is getting stronger because you're getting closer. D, which I haven't circled, but D. Is that okay? Next. So I've had a request for kinematics. Pardon me? Or torque. So let's try this. First of all, let's pause the recording for a second. So I've been asked to do some kinematics review, projectiles in particular. So these are from old provincial exam questions. You probably already have these somewhere in the kinematics review. Another teacher made these up, but I'd already done mine. But here's a good example. A 15 kilogram rock is projected, a projectile, horizontally from a very high cliff with a speed of 65 meters per second. We said, Alyssa, here was our strategy. For projectiles, we always broke everything into horizontal and vertical components. And there was three, well in particular two, key ideas. The fact that you knew the horizontal acceleration and you knew the vertical acceleration. What's the horizontal acceleration of a projectile in our magic physics world where everything works nice? Zero. What's the vertical acceleration in our magic physics world if we ignore air resistance? Negative 9.8. Then, almost always, I said, I'd like to know my horizontal velocity and my initial vertical velocity. Aaron, why didn't I put an initial right here? Well, because the acceleration is zero, there is no initial and final. The horizontal is constant. So in this diagram here, why can I say that? The split second I leave the cliff, have I started falling yet? So the split second I leave the cliff, what's my initial vertical velocity? Zero. My horizontal is that. Then, often they'll give me a displacement in this question. Now, this time they didn't. But if they gave me a displacement, they would either give me the range, horizontal, I'd write it here, or they'd give me the height, negative, because I've ended up below from where I started from, I'd write it here. Okay. And then I'd ask, what do they want me to find? Almost always you're going to use this to find time and then use time to find whatever distance they want. The only other question they're going to do is they're going to give you the time. Okay? In which case, that's usually easier. Now here, they've given me, what is the speed of the rock after it has fallen? They've given me a vertical distance of. So why is this wrong? Negative. Okay. As soon as I have a vertical or horizontal displacement, I bend my interests on that side to finding time of flight. What equation do I have that has A, V, D, and T in it? Ah, the gold noldy. D equals VIT plus one half AT squared. Conveniently, VI is zero, so this whole term vanishes. And in fact, I really have here is D 
equals a t squared over two. Let's get the t by itself. Times by two, divide by a, square root. Is that okay? t is going to be times by two, divide by a, square root. It's going to be the square root of 2 times negative 35 divided by negative 9.8. My negatives cancel, which is a good thing. 2 times negative 35 divided by negative 9.8. Square root. Time of flight is 2.673. seconds. Now, they could have asked me to now find the range. The range would be this. What happened to the half at squared? Miss zero on this side. Now, they didn't ask me to find the range. Instead, as an added twist, what they're telling me to find is the, oh, you don't have the question in front of you, speed. Okay. I think the speed is this number right here this thing. How can I find that? Ooh, it's a vector. I think I can find it by going horizontal plus vertical. The speed is right there. It is. Oh, what's the horizontal? Always 65. What's the vertical? Is it zero? No, it was at the beginning. Now it has some downward velocity. And in fact, really, I'm going to spend more time on this question finding VY final. VY final equals VY initial plus AT, I think is what I'm going to use here. I know is what I'm going to use here. VY final is zero, zip, zilch, not a x, nay, nicht. A is what? Negative 9.8. T is 2.673. I'll get a negative answer, which is good because it's going down. Negative 9.8 times 2.673. So this number times negative 9.8. Negative 9.8, Mr. Duick. Not times 98. You get 26.1960171. So negative. Negative 26.2. So right here, I can put a 26.2. I can ditch the negative now because the arrow says it's pointing down. How would I find V? No. That'd be to find an angle. How would I find V? Math 8. Pythagoras, girl. V squared is going to be 65 squared plus 26.2 squared. Because I think in this question, yeah, they asked for speed, not velocity. Velocity would then also require me to find an angle theta and then say that that angle was below the horizontal, and it would be this angle right here. But they didn't ask me to find that angle. That should be the answer. I hope, I think, I hope, I think, I hope. Ah, Troy, the clever boy. He says, Mr. Duick, look, I know horizontally is 65. The vertical is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, which means my hypotenuse is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What's the only hypotenuse bigger than 65 in the question? Yeah, Troy's irritating sometimes. I should have spotted that, actually. Well played. You know what? I'll even say that that's worth a candy. So here's a classic written question. Stunt vehicle. When our velocity was at an angle, what did we do? We never used it. We're not going to use the 35. What did we do instead? Components. And then it was going to be horizontal and vertical. So the very first thing I would do, and because I'm going to try and keep this all 
visible, I'll do it over here. So I would say here's 35. This angle, I don't know if you guys can see, is 28 degrees because it says. I have VY initial and VX. Why didn't I put an initial on the VX? Because the horizontal never changes. Opposite, hypotenuse, adjacent. I think VY initial ends up being sine. In fact, it ends up being 35. I'm cutting corners here, Melissa, if that's okay. 35 sine 28. And I think VX ends up being 35 cos 28. Horizontal, vertical, and I've already answered A. What are the vehicles? For? Oh, well, I haven't, I haven't crunched the numbers yet, Mr. Duick. Yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. Make sure I'm in degrees. I'm not. I'm in radians. Nice try. 35 sine 28. 16.43. I would go to two or three sig figs when I wrote my answer in A, but I'm going to been extras because I know I'm going to be using this. Thirty point nine. So VX thirty point nine. VY initial is sixteen point four three. I also know both accelerations automatically. If I'm in my magic physics world, ignoring air resistance, acceleration horizontally is what? Zero. And vertically is? Now, if I read this question, somewhere they gave me a distance. They either gave me the range. Well, I look. Actually, no. It looks like they're asking me to find the range, so I doubt they gave it to me. Or they gave me a vertical distance, the height of my jump. What is the vertical distance? 52. So what's my vertical displacement? Negative 52. How many pieces of information do I have horizontally? Two. How many do I have vertically? Three. Here's where I can find time. And here's what I'm going to use. D equals VIT plus a half AT squared. You're going to get negative 52 equals VI 16.43 t minus 4.9 t squared. Where'd the negative 4.9 come from? I did a half of 9.8 in my head because I've done it so often. And I'm trying to save 30 seconds here wherever I can. What kind of an equation is this? Why, it's a quadratic. How do I know? It's got a squared. How would I solve it? Make it equal to 0. And then absolutely, I would use the quadratic solver. Now, having said that, all of you, listen up for a second. You are totally allowed to use the quadratic solver. But if you do use the quadratic solver, just to fib to the marker, you have to do this somewhere. Otherwise, they may just assume that you cheated and copied the answer. Meanwhile, I'm going to ch uh, use technology. Here, Silver. Ah, Polly Smoltz. Press any key. Polynomial root finder. Degree 2. A. Negative 4.9. B 16.43. Sorry to those of you watching at home. I don't have a I don't have a program installed on my virtual TI. C 52. Solve. I'm getting 5.34. And one more value that's negative that I will reject. So I found B, time of flight. What does C want me to find? C wanted me to find the vehicle's range.
use dx equals vxt. My horizontal was 30.9. Time was 5.34. times 5.34. And I get 165 yards, meters. So there's a classic projectile. Watch, but I would like to talk about what shows up on the written section. So the first question on your written section of your mock exam, and if you're writing the provincial, same idea, is either going to be kinematics, and for kinematics, it's almost always a projectile, or a airplane in a, in a cross breeze. So what's the ground velocity? Or often they'll give you the ground velocity and, the, and say subtract the vectors to find the airspeed. Or forces. Now for forces, it's either going to be two masses or a ramp. Let me see if I can find you a good example of a question like that. So the types of forces questions that you'll see on the written section. So stuff like this. Let me make this a bit bigger so you can see a little easier. A can, uh, here's a can going up a ramp with an initial velocity. Eventually it's going to come to a stop. When will it come to a stop? I think you'll need to find out the net acceleration by going winner minus loser. Components, components, components. This is where we had parallel and perpendicular components. Or something like question number two, where you have a ramp and a hanging mass, an Atwood machine, we call this. So here you would have, in fact, let's do question number two together really quickly as an L quick review. So it says find the acceleration. And as a part B, they can ask you to do something with the acceleration using D, V, T, and V, F, and V, I, and all that stuff. But here I would go like this. I would say, okay, I have M2G and tension. I would start there because that's the easiest mass, and now I feel better. And I called it M2 because we said we usually label the masses from left to right. What are the forces acting on this one here? Well, I would have Mg down, tension, normal force at 90 degrees, and friction. However, Ari, we said this. This is good, perpendicular. These two are good because they're parallel to the rope. Gravity is a real issue. We would break gravity up into mg perpendicular to the ramp and mg parallel to the ramp where this angle here was this angle here. I think mg parallel often ended up being cosine and, or sorry, perpendicular often ended up being cosine and parallel often ended up being sine, but do the trig. Your equation would look like this. Who's winning? Well, this is six kilograms. Even if this was hanging straight down, would it be winning next to a 10 kilogram mass? And since it's not straight down, it's partly level, the 10 kilogram has to be winning. So we would say this. Winner, and I've decided down when I get here is winner, so the first tension is loser. But Aaron, this second tension, when I follow it across, ends up being a winner. Yay, tension cancels. I'd make some joke about relaxing when tension cancels or something like that, if I recall. And then I have two loser forces. I have minus friction and minus mg parallel. That equals M1 plus M2 times A, M both A. There's your equation. Tension cancels. 
you would find the, perp uh, the parallel component doing a bit of trig. Friction is what times what? Mu times the normal force. I don't know the normal force. Oh, but look, 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 look. I know another force the same size as the normal force. What? Mg perpendicular minus Mg. And you know what? It's mass 1, mass 1. I should include that. G parallel. That equals A divided by mass 1 plus mass 2. And now, Matt, Dylan, you'd be on to just doing the trig. You'd be sine and cosine. That's a classic forces type of a question. Okay. Other ones they like to ask for forces. So here's number three, another two-body mass question. This time it's a bit easier, but as a twist, they're asking you to find the tension. To find the tension, once you have the overall acceleration, to find tension, you would probably go to this because it's got fewer forces, and you would go winner minus loser equals, and since you're only looking at one mass, M2A. And now you could solve for tension because you know M2, you know G, and you just figured out A. Okay? Other good forces questions? You know, something like number 23 where they ask what distance will it move before it comes to rest. You have to find the overall acceleration first. And then, I guess it's slowing down. So you'd make the acceleration negative to make it slow down. V final is 0, V initial is 7, and you could solve for D. I think Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2AD. The other one that I've seen, can I find one here? Let me look. Um, be prepared for them to give you a question like this, maybe with one mass, but instead ask you to find mu, the coefficient of friction, so give you enough information that you know, oh, I can, uh, for example, if this was sliding down the hill, if they gave you V initial and V final and the distance, you could say, oh, I can find the acceleration, and if I know the acceleration, I could solve for mu as well. So uh, going forwards or backwards, Vitaly, on forces, Okay. That's going to be the first question on the written. Forces or kinematics? Uh, oh, also kinematics up here. For kinematics, don't, don't, don't forget the last question on the review. That was where we had the canon hitting a wall at a certain height, and we asked how far, what was the range, or something like that. That one's showed up more often recently. Okay? So lesson one and lesson two are combined. As are lesson three and lesson four. So that was what shows up on the test. One, two. Energy and momentum. Energy and momentum. What are classic written questions on energy and momentum? Definitely one of the favorite ones is uh, collision at an angle, like number one here. Okay? This is where you had to realize that you were doing vectors, and this is where we found the cosine law really shone. And then to find an angle, it was often sine law. So make sure you look at those. Now, this one's a bit of a twist. Instead of giving you the initial velocity, they gave you the initial kinetic energy. But if you know the mass and you know the kinetic energy, can you find the initial speed? It's a half mv squared, square root, right? The other ones they like are these type of uh, conservation of energy questions, like in number two. Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. Now, I've been very, very careful. The questions that you're going to see on your mocks are either from provincial exams that you've never seen that are no are longer available online that also haven't showed up on any of the reviews that I gave you, or they're questions that I've typed up myself and spent the time doing the graphics to do, or they are questions from old Alberta provincial exams. 
So look at your reviews, but be prepared for, oh, I haven't seen that specific type of, that specific question before. You'll have seen that type of question before. Okay? Momentum, collision. The last one is like number three, where they give you a collision. Now it's all linear, so you don't have to do vector momentum, but you have a change in momentum, change in speed, and then uh, use potential energy at the end to figure out how high they go. We did some like that on the review as well. In fact, I think I had one like that on your test. Can't remember now. So energy and momentum. Be alert for collisions. If they are at angles, use vectors. And cosine law was the most common one. Explosions. The initial momentum is zero, so the final vector triangle comes back on itself, right? It was a closed triangle where you ended up back where you started from if we had three pieces coming out of an explosion, okay? And then for energy, conservation of energy, Kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. And the work energy theorem, which was work equals change in potential plus change in kinetic. You guys can write the deltas, but I don't know where the delta symbol is on this program. And often, not always with tally, but often, one of these change-ins was zero, just to make it easier. Last thing, squared! The number of dumb mistakes we made in this unit, because it's a half mv squared, and we either forgot to square it, or when solving for v, we forgot to square root. That's going to be your second written question. Your third written question is going to be Equilibrium, probably, oh, torque. So let's do one since I've had a request. So there was two types of equilibrium questions. There was one like this, and a question like this, are there, is there a beam? Nope. So you would say use forces, and you would say to yourself, self, oh heck, Mr. Duick, copy and clip it. What are the forces acting on this? Get, get the obvious ones. And then we have tension 1 and tension 2. Kyle, is this thing accelerating at all? What's my net overall force then? How does that show up in my diagram? Now, I have three forces. I always draw the easiest one first, this one. Then I always draw the yuckiest one next. I think the yuckiest one is this one here. And then I draw the third one. But because the tally, the force is zero, what this means is my vector has to come back to where I started from. That's what zero looks like as a vector. And this question says the tension in cable two is how big? 12,000. All I gotta do now is find some angles. Well, let's see. How big is the angle between MG and tension one? How big is that angle right there? Can you read that, Troy? And how big is this right here? So you know what, I think it's 120 degrees right there. Uh, 
uh, I'm not quite sure what this is, but this is next to a vertical line. Here is next to a vertical line. How big is that angle right there? Ooh, I see a Z. See it, Matt? This angle up here is 20 degrees. So every triangle adds to 180. This angle down here is 40 degrees. And now, because I have a pair right here, I can use the sine law. What do they want me to find? They want me to find mg, the weight of the wrecking ball. Sine of that over that equals the sine of this over that. So that's one type of written question, but you guys really wanted me to do a torque question. You wanted me to torque about torque. <laughs> Tough audience. Yet I am. Something like number four. A uniform, blah, 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 blah. Is there a beam? Thork. Let's label all the forces on this beam. And if this was a small diagram, I would redraw it really huge. But this is a pretty big diagram. What are the forces acting on this beam? Get the obvious ones. Okay, which always goes center of mass right about there. That's going to be the mass of the beam times g. Then I also have m1g. And then I have tension. The problem is none of these are perpendicular to the beam. Oh, by the way, there's probably a force here because I'm seeing two downwards forces and no upwards forces. I'm sure there's a big force there, but I'm going to put my pivot there, so no torque, so who cares? Oh, and I'm seeing a force to the left which also means this guy is also probably pushing to the right. Who cares? It's right by the pivot area, so no torque. But to do torque, we had to break everything up into perpendicular components. Torque was the perpendicular force. I'm running out of room here a little bit, so let's do this. This is M1G perpendicular and tension perpendicular. Coming back to you a little bit, Alyssa. We then said, what did we write on every torque question? What was our standard approach? Give you a hint. The sum of all the torques clockwise in this direction equals the sum of all the torques counterclockwise in that direction. Clockwise, uh, what would cause it to spin around the hinge right there this way? Ah, tension perpendicular, right? Times its distance from the pivot, which is uh, 2.4 equals... Counterclockwise... M1G perpendicular times its distance from the pivot, which is 2.4 minus 0.5, 1.9, plus the mass of the beam G perpendicular times its distance from the pivot, which was, oh, center of mass, 1.2. Okay. How would I get tension perpendicular by itself? Okay, then I would carefully do the trig. Both of these are going to be sine or cosine. I'll let you try that yourself. That would give you tension perpendicular. I would put that there, and I would do the trig here. Oh, by the way, this angle is 35 degrees. So, ooh, this is a tough one. Let's turn on my use pen as pointer. That's this thing right here, right? Ready? How big? How big? Z, how big? 90 minus 35, how big? 35. That's 35 and that's 35 up there. What about in my tension triangle? 
Oh, okay. Um, how big? 35. Now I've got a Z, 35. Whew. Who knew that high school grade 11 geometry would come in handy? Is that enough of a, because I'm running out of time, is that enough of a review? Okay. Then we come to circular motion gravitation. What kind of questions can you at, expect? Orbit. Obits? Yeah, I feel like I'm going to die. It's an obit. No. Orbits. Obrits? Good gosh. Orbits. Okay. The great McDonald come to the office. FC please? equals F net questions. Note, and I still saw this on the magnetic forces test that we haven't gone over that I could have gone over today and just thought of that right now, but that's okay. I still see this. I still see this. F equals V. Well, I'll just write it. I'm still seeing F equals V squared over R. Garbage! That's never been a force. Look on your formula sheet. What is V squared over R? Acceleration. How can I make an acceleration into a force? Apparently I forgot to turn that thing off. Okay. Also, note, if in space station, normal force equals FC. In a space station that was rotating, it was the normal force that worked out to your centripetal force. We said that centripetal force was always your net force. It never shows up on the free body diagram. It shows up in the winner minus loser equals something. Okay? Also for orbits, work energy orbit questions. How much work to lift something up? Remember, work is change in kinetic plus change in potential, but now we have to use the cosmic potential, which was negative big G, big M, little m over R squared. Okay. Then there's going to be an electro, electrostatic question. Voltage, electric field, all that good stuff. Then there's going to be a circuitry question, magnetic forces, or induction question. They're technically the same unit. Then there's going to be a Analyze, come on, Mr. Duick. Analyze a graph question. That's number eight. It's either going to be the slope or the area. If it's a slope, divide the formula or divide the units to figure out what the heck the slope is. If it's an area, multiply the variables or multiply the units to figure out what the area is. And then the very last written question is going to be a using principles of physics right to explain question. That's the written. Nine questions. To get a good idea of what it's going to look like, look at the four exams that I gave you. There's, some of them are still sitting here. And you'll notice they all follow that pattern. You'll notice, oh yeah, number five is electrostatics <coughs> almost every time. Oh yeah, number seven is magnetic forces almost every time, which also means you can kind of figure out what topic you're in by what number you're on, which might help you look at a certain spot on the formula sheet. If you want to go through your magnetic forces test, 
I am around today after school. I am around tomorrow after school. Um, I'll be in Wednesday morning at like 8. I'll be in at lunch as well, but that won't help you because you guys are writing before lunch. No, you guys are writing after lunch. So I'll be in my room Wednesday at lunchtime if you have any induction questions. If you need me to induce knowledge out of induced voltage. <laughs> that it is. Yeah, there's no other 